shaking and my heart's pounding you always take me make me lie down in peaceful fields where i can clear my head cause i get so overcome with anxiety like there's an enemy living inside of me like a mucker yelling out telling lies to me and i don't feel brave but i don't have to be cause i walk through the valley of shadow Scared me half to death, but you're with me everywhere I go. So I won't give up yet. My fears would surely kill me if I didn't know the truth. The things that I'm afraid of are afraid of you. When my emotions turn against me, not faith, no reason. To me, I can get the medication and the counseling. Still, I can hear the fear calling out to me, and I don't feel brave, but I don't have to be. Cause I walk through the valley of shadows, and it scared me half to death. But you're with me everywhere I go, so I won't give up yet. My fears would surely kill me if I didn't know the truth. The things that can't find me but just wait till they see who's standing behind me i walk through the valley of shadow and it scared me half to death but you're with me everywhere i go so i won't give up yet my fears will surely kill me if i didn't know the truth the things that kind of lost this way yeah crazy as it seems yeah i know it's gonna be okay okay it 
Spirit is moving over the waters of our tears. Our bodies are yearning for the joy of coming here. But the Spirit turns our empty groaning into prayer. Even now we wait in. Spirit move, keep on moving. Spirit move, keep on moving. Creation is groaning with the pain of giving birth. A new life is coming. Resurrecting all the earth. When we don't know what to pray, the Spirit groans for us. For the breaking of the day that lifts us from the dust. Spirit, move. Keep on moving. of our hearts and sing out within us of the promises of God we are weary with the years but hope is being born even through our pain and fear Spirit, move, keep on moving. Spirit, move, keep on moving. Oh, keep on moving. Oh, keep on moving.
Sing worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And on that day, we join the resurrection and stand beside the heroes of the faith. With one voice, a thousand generations sing. I could describe it, but I can't contain it, can't keep it to myself. There are enough colors to paint the whole picture, not enough words to ever say what I found. Wonderful. my God, that's my shepherd, my protector, that's my king, that's my rock, that's my anchor.
Just what you need. Don't ever doubt. Stand firm, be strong. I know he'll see you through. Just rest is working all out. Don't you give up? You got more to do. Let's stand together. We're going to sing a song called Your Name is Power, declaring the power of Jesus over all sin and all darkness in our world. Let's do it.
Never mind, we're not going to do it. No, I think that's what's buzzing. Let me try unplugging it and plugging it back in. All right, we'll go without it. Yeah. Yep, let's do it. to the darkness You're the only right among the wrong You're the only hope among the chaos You are the voice that calls me on Louder than every lie My sword in every fight The truth will chase away the night. Your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle, mighty won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power, yeah. Hope is certain. I know that the word will never fail. I know that in every situation, you speak the power to prevail. Louder than, louder than every lie. My sword and every fight, the truth will chase away the night. Your name is power over darkness, freedom for the captives, mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle, mighty won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power, yeah, your name is power. darkness light arrives and heaven opens holy spirit let us hear it when you speak the church awakens we believe the change is coming holy spirit let us see it when you speak the scattered darkness light arrives and heaven opens holy spirit Let's declare this. When you speak, the church awakens. We believe that change is coming. Holy Spirit, let us see it. Your name is power over darkness. Freedom for the captives. Mercy for the broken and the hopeless. Your name is faithful in the battle, glory in the struggle. Mighty won't let us down or fail us. Your name is power in the darkness. Your name is power in the chaos. Your name is power. Amen. Amen. Hey, let's pray. God, um, help us to be a voice um, for people who don't have a voice. Help us to be the love for the disenfranchised. 
And I just pray, God, that when we sing a song like that, that we realize that you show us your power and that you, you work through our brokenness. You work through my brokenness, for, through our failures, God. And so this morning, we, we want to we uh, declare this day for you, uh, declare this morning for you. And I just pray, God, that this morning that you would speak to us, that you would speak through um, Pastor Eric, that you would speak through the music, that you would help us be vulnerable before you. God, so we, we lay it all at your feet. We, we lay our stress, our anxiety, um, our hurts, our pain, our joys, our celebrations. We give them to you this morning, God. We love you so much. In Jesus' name, amen. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaking, Amen. I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause He's never let me down. He's faithful through generations, so why would He fail now? He won't. Yes. He won't. I've still, I've still got joy in chaos. I've got peace that makes no sense. I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I build my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So why would He fail now? He won't is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand, when everything around me is shaking, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, cause he's never let me
He won't. Amen. He won't fail. He won't fail. Well, come on, everybody. Let's give God praise. Come on, let's give God praise. Good morning. If you know you serve a God who will not fail and has not failed you, come on as you take your seats. Let's give God our best praise. Hallelujah. Good morning. You may be seated in the Lord's presence. My name is Ken. I'm excited to invite you here. Excited that you have joined us today. Excited that everyone is in the house. Good morning. If you're joining us online, my name is Ken again. I'm excited that you have chosen to worship with us here today. If you're joining us for the first time, we would ask you to fill out one of our Connect cards. It can be found on the back of the seat in front of you. If you're joining us online, this can be found on our digital bulletin. Speaking of our bulletin, it tells you all the latest of what's happening here at Common Ground Northeast. We are a church on the move. There's a lot happening here all the time. Go to the digital bulletin, find out all the latest of what's happening and our schedule going forward for the holidays. I'd like to give you just a few things though to bookmark. Uh, during Advent season, which starts next week, uh, we'd ask you to bring some decorations that mean a lot to you. We'll add them to the church decorations. So all throughout the season, there's something that means something to you. Bring it, and we'd like to display it. Also, officially tonight at 6 o'clock, invite everyone to come. We're going to decorate the church tonight at 6 o'clock. If you'd like to be a part of that decorating committee, that process, please come. Bring some of your decorations, and we're going to decorate the church tonight at 6 o'clock. Our couples ministry, which does a great job here, asks everyone to tap in on uh, Saturday, December 7th. Uh, we're having a couple's brunch, so we want everyone to plan to pay uh, to come and attend that. Uh, child care deadline, however, ends soon, so the event is off-site, but you can bring your children here. We'll watch your children and then go and join with other couples and have brunch. Also, it is my personal goal to pray with everybody in the church before the end of the year, and as you know, uh, that's not far. So we'd ask you to go on pray, uh, Planning Center. And I'd love an opportunity to pray with you. You need to sign up for that, though. I just want to pray over you, your family, had a blessing to your life. Uh, Phil, God has called me to do that. And I've already signed up. I'd ask you to go and make that registration complete. Come on, everybody. Let's give God praise. At this time, we have a very special engagement highlight. Bill Neal's going to come up at this time and introduce our engagement highlight. Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's, if you've been live here the last couple of weeks, you know that we're walking through kind of each of our engagement partners during this season. So we had Anthony Beverly from Stop the Violence here two weeks ago, and then we were privileged to hear from the Wallaces last week. It was encouraging for me, and I'm on the engagement team, so I get to hear about this quite regularly. So I'm hoping you guys uh, enjoy hearing about it as well. Today, though, we get to hear from Outreach. Outreach is, I think, our longest uh, partner. They're one of the OG partners for, uh, for Common Ground Northeast. And we're privileged today to have uh, Katie Blodgett, if I pronounce that right, and then Jeb Gaither. Uh, Katie works for Outreach. Jeb is one of our congregants here, of course, and uh, he volunteers there. I had uh, got an email from Outreach uh, maybe a week or two ago that says there's 81 youth who experienced homelessness in Indiana, Indianapolis in the last year. Let that sink in for a minute. 88,100 youth just in Indianapolis uh, that experienced homelessness. And uh, obviously that's where outreach focuses their efforts. So uh, Katie and Jeb, if you wanna come up and uh, just explain a little bit what's going on at outreach. Hey everybody, thanks for having me. Um, I'm really excited to get to share about outreach and the work that we're doing. Um, I have been involved with outreach in some way or another since 2016. I've had three different roles since I've been there. Um, but as an organization, we've been around since 1996, um, which is kind of surprising. A lot of people don't know about it, but it's been a local organization since then. Um, on the screen, 
Hopefully it'll go automatically, but Mr. Guy who's running the slides, excellent, great. Um, they're on a timer, hopefully it works. On the screen behind me, you'll just see some pictures that I put together of our Eastside Program Center, which is our main program center, and then just events that we host throughout the year. Um, I'm hopeful that you'll be able to see a lot of the fun that we get to have at Outreach um, and just how big of a, of a celebration organization we are um, as we're also providing for basic needs. Um, so yeah, I'm so glad Bill got to mention Common Ground has been a supporter of Outreach, at least financially, since 2018, and that's a really long time. And I bet there was involvement beforehand, whether that's in kind or just sending volunteers. Um, that's a really long time to sustain a relationship with an organization, so I'm really grateful that you guys have continued to pour into us um, and see the value in what we're doing. We can't do what we do without monetary donations, and then in-kind donations. So many of the things that we pass out, those physical items that our clients are getting are donated items, whether that's hygiene items, clothing, shoes, um, things like that, deodorant, stuff like that. Um, as Bill said, we run this really confusing census, uh, like, whatever it's called, formula. And two years ago, the number of homeless youth, 14 to 24 year olds in Marion County was 7,200. And in two years, that number has jumped to 8,100. Um, and we know that is still probably an undercounted uh, number um, for, for the number of 14 to 24 year olds experiencing homelessness. Um, since 2019, we served 400 youth in a year Last year, we served 830 youth in the year, and we're on track to serve over 830 youth again this year. So we know we're only hitting like a teeny tiny number of that 8,100, um, but we have seen our numbers skyrocket as well. So we know that that is real. Um, we don't doubt that that 8,100 uh, is true. Um, we definitely know that that's real. And then for you guys to know, <clears throat> since, you're, since you're in Lawrence Township, um, the Lawrence Township area, in the first month and a half of school, the Lawrence Township schools coded over 400 students already as homeless. Um, there is a, a, the McKinney-Vinto Act, which um, the social workers are aware of, and they help students who are experiencing homelessness with their families. So already, the first month and a half of school, over 400 students in the local area here um, have been coded as homeless with their families. Um, so our services, hopefully you saw the, the pictures of our main program center on the east side, we provide easy access to basic needs. If you haven't been to outreach yet, people can come on in, do their laundry, take a shower, get clothing, um, get hygiene items at no cost to them. We don't require anything from them in return besides hopefully a smile or like at least a like thank you. Uh, but some, we don't even require that, it's fine. Um, we also have a program that goes into the high schools. Um, we're currently in all of the IPS high schools, um, Lawrence Township, Pike Township, and Washington Township. So the goal is to keep the students who have been designated as homeless there um, in school, on the path to graduation, and connected to resources that are helpful. <clears throat> so around the holidays, the thing is gonna loop, so that's good. Um, around the holidays, we do a Thanksgiving and a Christmas celebration separately. Thanksgiving in November, Christmas in December. Um, and that's just a really fun time. I mean, you think of these uh, kids. I don't like to call them kids. We call them youth and young adults, but they really are. They're kids. They're 18 to 25 year olds, 14 to 25 year olds um, that we're seeing, and they don't have a family. They don't have a place to go for Thanksgiving or Christmas. Um, so that's something that we really want to make sure that we do year after year is providing um, at least a celebration and at least a home cooked meal that's delicious and fun. Um, so that's something that we do year after year. Um, you probably saw also on the slides, we do two really big uh, fundraisers through the year. One is Walking for Dreams. That's a really fun uh, thing for the whole family. You can bring dogs. Um, and then Transform, which is our big like gala fundraiser thing, which is also really cool to get to um, just really like love on our donors um, and they can invite their own community in, which is really fun. So um, I encourage you, if you haven't been to Outreach yet, I love to give tours and show the space off. So you can email me, I'm on the website, um, 
and I'd love to show you around. Check out our social media as well, um, Instagram especially. We're posting a lot of really good videos um, lately, especially through this month and into December as well. So I've got some questions for Jeb because Jeb has been a volunteer longer than I've even worked at Outreach. How, when did you start volunteering? I what year? Can't remember. He can't even remember. So a long time. He's an OG volunteer for sure. Um, so I would just like Jeb. Can you help us define homelessness a little bit more? Yes, I'd like to add two things about homelessness that you might not be aware of, and maybe it'll expand your horizon a little because it's a very, very complicated, multidimensional study uh, subject. One thing is the average age of a homeless person in Marion County is eight years old. And uh, a lot of families lose their homes for all kinds of reasons. One you may not be aware of is families lose their homes because of very excessive high medical bills that they can't pay. And that could happen to any of us, really. Uh, the other thing I'd say about homelessness is it's all over the place rural, urban, as Katie pointed out, Lawrence Township. Uh, the ARCH program she mentioned that works in high school has teams at uh, and then Lawrence North, Lawrence Central, and the most recent high school system who's asked for help is the Carmel High School. So it's everywhere. Um, and then Jeb, could you tell your fellow members, why do you volunteer at Outreach? What's it like? Well, first of all, it's fun most of the time. <laughs> uh, it's interesting uh, to see kids come in and go. I am involved with checking a lot of new kids into the program and getting to know their stories and the like. But it usually takes three or four years from a kid to start at the bottom until they make it up to the point where they're kind of more self-sufficient and can go out at, back out into the world. Uh, we lose a lot along the way, there's failures along the way, but there's some real successes. One of the kids from a couple years ago learned about software in our computer lab. He now runs a very successful software company. Another individual was the commencement speaker at his high school graduation. He's now married to another outreach alumni, and they're super parents. And we're working right now with a kid that uh, is starting a business to repair cell phones. So there's all kinds of things like that going on all the time, and that is a real source of joy in spite of some of the disappointments we hit. The final thing I wanted to do is ask you with a prayer request. Katie mentioned the big party we had at Thanksgiving time with all kinds of turkey and fun and the like including warm clothes for winter. However, unfortunately, this year may be one of the worst years Indianapolis has had for places to stay that are warm and safe over the winter time for a whole bunch of reasons. So I would ask you to pray for our youth over the Thanksgiving time that they will be safe on the streets, to find a warm place if they can, and do that as well at Christmas time. Thank you. Thank you, guys. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, both of you guys. Really appreciate uh, the work that goes on there. Uh, just as a reminder, we have, a, as a Common Ground, we have a long history of doing special giving over the Advent season. And this year, uh, we've talked about the last, the last couple weeks, we're just going to, everything that's donated via our text to give option between now and Christmas, everything that's donated that way is just going to be divided uh, between our, our standard partners. So we give our, our partners monthly uh, uh, donations, but this is an extra above and beyond donation. So is the number up there? Yeah. So 84321, uh, text a dollar amount uh, to that number, and everything that comes in over uh, this season is going to be divided amongst all of our partners. And we're just excited to be able to bless all of our partners just in a special way uh, during the Advent season. So one more quick announcement for the last month. A month and a half probably we've been collecting clothes for black women's voices uh, they had their event I think it was yesterday uh, and it was a hugely successful event so we're really thankful uh, for the donations that came in so thank you for that those that were helpful in getting that set up and taking care of it was just another way uh, black women's voices not a full partner of ours yet we're hoping that will become the case as uh, resources allow but we're excited to be able to bless them 
uh, through our donations and our space here. So uh, that's our engagement highlights for the week. Uh, if you want to stand up and uh, greet someone around you and kids through fourth grade, we're going to dismiss you uh, to your class right now. Uh, yeah, welcome. Wow, I just feel the presence of the Lord in this place. God is here. We're all here. As we come back together, would you all stand with me? As we come back together, we feel the presence of the Lord. It's such a blessed morning. What a great opportunity we all have to be in God's presence and to be with one another. This is the time where we do our liturgy and we focus. We focus our time and our attention on the reason that we are here. We focus on our time. Would you join me in doing our liturgy? Come on, everybody. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Come on, everybody, let's worship. Time and time again, 
you have proven you do just what you say though the storms may come and the winds may blow i'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word it will come to pass great is your faith the setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to me may pass away, your word remains the same, your history can move, there's nothing you can't do, you're faithful and true, though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast, and let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to
Worthy of every song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe We live for you We live for you Jesus Jesus, the name above every other name. Jesus, the only one who could ever say. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe. We live for you. Oh, we live for you. Holy. Holy, there is no one like. Beside you, open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. above every other name Jesus the only one who could ever save worthy of every breath we could ever breathe we live for you
Amen. Father, thank you for being God who's with us. Help us to see all those around us. And to be open, especially then uh, just to the holidays. Father, I pray for Pastor Eric as he comes up and as he brings this last message. Um, Father, will you just continue to bring these um, lessons that we've learned just up in our lives throughout the season and as we go into 2020 to be God. Amen. 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 Go ahead and have a seat. Thank you all for leading us this morning, bringing our, our minds and our hearts and our lives and the words of our voices around these ideas. Um, that are so tied to, these are songs, um, many of the ones that we played, uh, sang today, um, are, are songs directly related and connected to the Sermon on the Mount and the things that we're talking about today. And so I, w I want us to just acknowledge that we profess some things from our lips and our hearts and our minds as the team has led us that maybe our minds haven't fully um, caught up to or maybe our hearts haven't fully surrendered to in the midst of these things. And so what I want to do is um, just jump right in. We've got a good bit to cover at the very end here, and we have plenty of time to do it, but I want us to be prepared in our minds, prepared in our hearts, prepared in our souls um, to encounter. Would you open up your um, Bibles to Matthew 7? Open up your Bibles to Matthew 7, and you, you should know today is the epic conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, 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 Mount. Yeah. This is, this is like where all of Jesus' teachings have been taking us. It's where we have been driving this thing towards, and that as we have like tried to fill this in and, and, and view it through the lens of a political manifesto so that it shapes our hearts and minds during a political season, we are going to now come to a point where Jesus is going to drive us to this conclusion. And one of the things I wanted to remind you of is we've been taking notes, um, a good bit of notes from the Bible Project throughout, uh-oh, someone's been messing with this. All right. As we have been taking notes, um, much of it from uh, uh, kind of Jewish root sources. Oh, no. You know how many times I've done this, right? Smooth. It looked all smooth, right? Now I'm like a bumbling idiot. Just, all right. There we go. I want, uh, I want to remind us that we've been trying to look through this. There's three major sections, and, and, God, and the way Jesus did this is very intentional, and he's been organizing your thoughts, ordering them in a specific way, so that you would understand that the Beatitudes in this first section, the intro was what? The surprise, say it with me, just say it with, humor it, humor it. Say it one more time, the surprise identity. And then there's this body section in the middle that had three distinct parts, and that Jesus was directly trying to bring us towards understanding that he is addressing and connecting himself to the Torah, to the law, and to the prophets. Everything that he mentions in that first section of the body is directed towards that. And then he goes into this relational, kind of, or religious practice part of it. And then the last part is more of a practicality of how our right relationships work together with one another. And all of this has been kind of building, and the reason I need to rebring this back to your mind is in the end he's going to point back to a few things very strategically that I want you to be aware of. This outro, this last little piece, it's, it's like maybe less than 10% of the entire thing, and it's going to drive us to two choices. 
And he's going to use three different metaphors that say there are two of these, there are two of these, there are two of these. And we're going to break each one of those things down as we come to the final part of this. A couple of weeks ago now, um, I, I was reminded of this as I was prepping, I was playing laser tag with um, our family and some friends because it was one of our kids' birthdays. And as we entered this thing, there was a couple of other kids, maybe junior high, middle school, and they were participating in it with us. And you could tell these kids had been around the laser tag block a few times. They play there a lot. They had been there all morning. It was two friends, and they jumped in with almost everyone that we did. And as we were looking at this, um, this game, which was essentially to get a station, turn it to your color, and get it there for as long as possible, and there's like nine or so stations worth different values, I'm like, oh, this is perfect. We're going to be able to out-hustle these kids. In fact, we got all the adults as they broke down the teams. We had most of the adults on our team. I'm like, yes. This is going to be it. We're going to take these kids out. And, and then as we started to do this, we get into this, um, this battle, and you're, you're lighting up the things, and you're shooting the like, kids with the little laser tag thing. And I'm like trying to get people to move, like keep going, good old-fashioned hustle. That's how we're going to win this thing. If we move faster than the children in the room, then we're going to keep these stations. But it wasn't really working. And honestly, I was quietly getting frustrated at all the people I saw walking around on my side that were on my team. Like, y'all need to move faster. There's a station over there. Just turn. Go back and take care of that station. As we're going back and forth, we lost the first game by a decent margin. Okay, so what's the answer? More hustle. You got to work harder. You got to move faster. And you got to get this thing down, right? We do that, and we actually win the second game. And I'm like celebrating like perfect Although, as my kids reminded me later, we barely won that second game. Then the third game comes around, and we, it's, it's a tiebreaker moment, right? We get to it, and we lost, not by a little bit, but by a whole lot of points. And so the adults kind of walk away in shame. And I was trying to figure out, like, how did we lose so bad? Well, obviously, it's because we didn't hustle. Uh, we need to fight harder. We need to move faster. We need to get these. And I asked my kids on the other side. They were on the other team. I said, what was your strategy? And they looked at me, and they were like, well, well the basic strategy was just left defenders at each of those stations, right? So, and then we keep going on to the next one and then circulate around. But what you didn't know is that we were tricking you the whole time, and we were using the special powers. I'm like, how are you tricking me? So he says, well, you guys are running around all crazy, hustling, trying to get from place to place. So what we would do is shoot the little station, then you'd shoot us, and we'd be like, oh, you got me, and then you didn't realize we weren't actually out of power, and as soon as you ran away to get to the next station, we just took it back immediately and kept them. So the whole time, you were just pretending to be shot, and then you would come back and take. Then there were little superpowers. Who's got time to look at the little screen for superpowers when you're hustling around? But they knew what they were doing. This is my favorite one was the spy one, and you know what we did? We just walked around with your colors on our pack, shooting you guys as you yelled at us because we were walking around too slow, telling all your team to hustle, hustle, hustle. And they destroyed us. Like, like check, check this out. This is why it was reminded. One, it's just a fun little, little image. But I'm like, I was so stuck to this one way of doing things. I mean, I was convinced. It's like, we've got this. They, they're, they're, like, we've got the work ethic on our side. We're going to be strategic, get these things. But I was so stuck on this one way of doing things. And in the end, I didn't have all the information. They took some time and looked around like, oh, we can like triple our power. We can double our points. We can do it. We have all these superpowers that are at our disposal. I didn't even look at it once, even though they kept telling me about it. I was like, I don't got time for that. I got to run around and do these things. My way works in the past. I have experience with hustle being the thing that puts you in front of other people when you're in a workplace place scenario. You just keep getting going. And then I had this pride, right? Like, I'm the dad. Of course, us and the other adults are going to be the ones to figure out the best strategy, and we're going to stick to it. And what I was doing was making a decision between two things. All I had to do was exchange my wisdom for the ones that they were bringing to my attention. I would have had a better game. And I want you to think about how this applies in so many different areas in our life. Sometimes you have to surrender something that you thought was smarter or wiser in order to gain something new that is a new kind of wisdom, in order to grow into something that isn't just adding to the old knowledge, but is an exchange of things that you have to pour something out in order to bring something new in. And it's hard. It's actually very hard to give up what you think is working. It's the path of well, I'm attached to it now, and I'm convinced that this is the right way. This works. 
Or it's the path of you've been operating in it so long and it's just baked into your mind and the rhythms of your life and you can't deviate from that path because this is what's established. It's the path of sometimes it's the only way you've ever known. I just don't know any better. It's the path of least resistance that sometimes this is just the easiest route to go. I want to choose the more difficult path when the easy one is right here. And so here's how I want to start. Pastor Kim will uh, 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 commonly do this. He'll have us raise up our cup. Hold up your cup. It's an imaginary cup, but it's a cup nonetheless. And he tells us, fill my cup, Lord, and let it overflow. And what I want to do today in conversation with a friend of mine who said sometimes, oh, 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 put those back up. Whoa. Uh, He said, sometimes I got too much in my cup when Pastor Ken says that. And I need to pour a little bit out so I can receive something. So this is what I want you to fill what's, uh, take what's in your cup and just pour it out. Turn it over. Let that be done. Now, Put it right side up, and I want you to say this. Fill my cup anew. Fill my cup anew. And let it overflow. Amen. Matthew 7, starting in verse 13, says this. Enter through the narrow gate. That word narrow is restricted, not just small, but restricted and often related to the idea of pressure being put on it. Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it, but small is the gate, and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Jesus establishes two gates corresponding to some roads. The gate and the road path and uh, road and path imagery is pretty relatable to us today. We know what gates are, we know what roads are, but if you're living in Jesus' time, it's actually more tangible. There, there's all kinds of gates, especially in the area that he was living. If you went to Jerusalem or towards the temple, it was like this giant labyrinth of gates. Some of them were simple. Some of them were decorative and fancy. There were paths. There were stairwells. In fact, I think we might have a little picture of a few of these types of gates. You see the pathway. You see kind of modernized doors on the right. You see a little bit fancier ones down on the right. Do the next one. This is an old one, one of the main gates. This is ancient. You see these pathways. You see how some of them, you could go up the stairs, through the hallway, on the left, up the stairs. You're even standing in a gate from this view. This is probably my favorite one. All of these pathways, all of these gates are a very tangible, everyday experience for anyone who's living in Jesus' time. And so as they're looking at these archways, doors, there are actually eight main ways to get into the city from the outside. Eight gates with a very defined and symbolic purpose attached to them. They weren't just physical entryways. They weren't just um, doors. Centers of life would happen at the gate. Hosting public discussions, doing business would take place at these gates. Religious teachings would happen, legal proceedings, all kinds of stuff. And I'm going to give you a couple of examples. The Golden Gate, which is the East Gate, provided access to the Temple Mount from the uh, uh, provided access to the Temple Mount. So it was associated with messianic prophecies and expected the entry of the Messiah would come through here. In fact, it's the gate that Jesus comes through on the donkey later on in his gospel. Then you have the dung gate. This one's pretty self-explanatory. This is the gate that they brought all of the refuse out, and they would take it to a place called Gehenna that's often translated hell, where they would burn all of the trash. Makes for a great metaphor, doesn't it? It symbolized purification, the removal of things out of this gate so that the rest of the city could be clean. You have the Zion Gate connected to the homes of wealthier folks. You have the Fish Gate linked to the fish market and facilitating Mediterranean commerce that takes place from the Sea of Galilee. You have the Sheep Gate, which is obviously for bringing in sheep, but also what do we use sheep for? The sacrificial system. And so it's associated with the sacrificial system in that time. And there's multiple gates, and they have associations, metaphors, and all kinds of things attached to them. But there's also a a long-standing tradition in the Jewish history of this metaphor of two pathways, two roads, linked to the idea of wisdom, wise and unwise. One of the very first paths or gates mentioned is when Adam and Eve choose poorly. 
They are unwise and they eat of the fruit and so they are banished from the Garden of Eden and they are put on a path out of this place where they are now uh, not allowed to re-enter. In fact, Genesis says, so the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden, catch this, the east side, cherubim. And a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. You've got, I think Tim Mackey called this divine bodyguards standing at this gate. Angels. The gate is this binary path that's echoing over and over. In fact, you see order as the spirit flows over creation and the waters of chaos. Do you see how there's two things playing together? Then the next one, you see Deuteronomy 30. It says, see, I set before you today a life of prosperity. Uh, Today, life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, to keep his commandments, decrees, and laws. Then you will live in increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. You see the Pharaoh versus Moses scenario playing out. The Bema Project discipleship group says this, there's a narrative built on fear and there's a narrative built on trust. There are two competing narratives that are running all throughout the book of Exodus. Psalm 1 says, blessed is the one who doesn't walk in step of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners. Take or sit in the company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord and who meditates on the law day and night. Proverbs is packed with this one-two decision, gate left, gate right, path this way, path that way. The prophets call it a straight path and a crooked path and that you should avoid the crooked path. Make my path straight, O Lord. Do you see how this is happening all over the Old Testament? And so here's this mental note that I want you to see is that Jesus is ending his lesson by identifying himself back with Genesis and Exodus, with the law, with the prophets. The whole thing comes full circle. He opened up these loops earlier on when he introduced this lesson, and now he is closing this thing up for a couple of different reasons. One is that the audience he's talking to, the Jewish people he's talking to, it adds weight to it. He's pulling from their history to make this a heftier, more weightier point at the end, but the second thing is that he clarifies this theme that has been happening since the very first line in the Bible. He is going to make us choose chaos or order, Pharaoh or Moses, the crooked path or the straight path. He's going to make us choose. Are you going to come with me or are you going to go with the other gods of this earth? So this is, this is an interesting thing for us to ingest because if you're like me, as I was preparing for this, I'm like, I don't like this A-B choice. I don't like ones and twos. I love that gray area in between where we can kind of swim in the warmth of all of this and be like, ah, you know, let's spend some time thinking about it and, and let's take a little bit from here and there. And I want to I live in this world where there's a spectrum of options landing on like this reflective space where we can just sit with like this, um, this idea of, of, um, of, of knowing that there's some things we just can't know. And sometimes there is a great need for that. But here, it's like Jesus gets to the end of this, and he goes old school Baptist altar call. Where'd they get that from? I guess the Sermon on the Mount. I don't know. And so we have this divine altar call where Jesus um, brings us to a point of conclusion. D.A. Carson says, what you find Jesus saying four times is there are two ways, two paths, two houses, two kinds of disciples, two kinds of prophets, just two. And one is good, and one is bad. And that our culture can sound des- and that in our culture can sound desperately narrow. And it does feel desperately narrow, doesn't it? And so the obvious parts of this metaphor is that we have a wide gate over here. It's easier to walk through. There's plenty of room. It's the path of least resistance. It's very accessible. Many people can get through it. 
and, and it's broad enough that, that it's like, oh, that's probably the right path to go. Let's go in that direction. But he says that is the path that leads to ruin. And over here is a narrow gate. It's harder to access. It offers more resistance. Fewer people are going to find it. It's less obvious. It feels limiting, restricting even. It feels like it's sometimes oppressed and limiting. But ultimately, this is the life that leads, or this is the path that leads to life. And so as we're looking at these two things, what we have seen is that many of the teachings over here are counterintuitive. That adds, it's like this, this feels normal. This feels like the right way to go. And this path is the one that leads us over here to uncomfortable conversations, to more resistance. This is the path over here that Jesus has pitted against the world, and it will feel like restriction instead of wisdom. There will be moments, listen, there will be moments when people will resist the type of choice that you're making based on Jesus' leading, and they won't just disagree with it, they will be absolutely offended that you went in that way. That's resistance. I'm going to keep quoting as we've been using the Bible Project throughout this whole, um, uh, uh, this whole teaching, this whole series. Tim, Tim Mackey says, For cultures that glorify violence, the way of Jesus will not just seem backwards but offensive. In cultures that celebrate sexual liberation, the way of Jesus will look very backwards and oppressive, prudish. In cultures that celebrate unbridled accumulation of wealth, the way of Jesus will look like you're stifling a flourishing economy. It's counterintuitive way that will lead to pressure from the outside and force you to be very discerning moment to moment as to what the way of the correct gate is. So it's not just this one decision. It's like moments of decisions that we're always making and which one is being offered to us at a given time. And there will be a wide variety of reasons not to follow Jesus. Remember, this path is big. The limitations are just too heavy to bear. This, this, this is something that I, I the test, I, I'm not going to win this test. I, I don't know how to, how to beat this thing. The, I'll be asked to surrender way too much if I go down this way. Let me say it this way. If you've accepted Jesus and decided to follow him, then you've accepted a kind of death. That language isn't abnormal to the Christian life. But it's the death that leads to resurrection. It's the death that leads to the hope that life is on the other side. And so if you remember at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount, the very identity of the people who were chosen to herald and represent this politic, how did Jesus describe them? Well, blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who are persecuted. The language that they use is that the good life belongs. That's what blessing means. The good life belongs to those who pour in spirit. The good life belongs to the meek. And so it actually makes a lot of sense that if this is the choice and this is how hard it is, can you understand how when you come over here, you're like, oh, that actually makes sense. Because if you have been a, a kind of person who has been persecuted, who has been poor, who has been down this, like you already know how to endure persecution. This is just life to you. That's not actually that hard. That's not that scary to go over here because, look, there is a person over here who's like, I know what that's like. I, I already have given up. I don't have much to lose or to exchange in this situation. Of course I'm choosing God in this. They're already pressed on all sides and oppressed by other people. So when you see this identity and you get over here, please hear me. For most of us, we have to look at this person and say, you're the expert in the kingdom of God. Please teach me. Because I don't know actually how it is to walk this path, but it looks like you've already been trained by your life situation to walk in a kind of way that is the kingdom of God. And so one of these things that we want us to understand is that there is a surrender that maybe your strategy isn't always the right way. And that there's an expert in the room in the form of the poor and the lowly and the hurting that we have to begin learning from if we're going to understand even what the kingdom of God is. 
Now, we got a couple more sections to cover, so I'm going to push forward. Two paths, there's a choice, but there's not just a choice that we make alone. There are enticers along the way, false guides trying to lure us to move in this wider gate through this path. It says in verse 15, watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ferocious wolves. By their fruit, you will recognize them. Do people pick grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Likewise, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Thus, by their fruit, you will recognize them. And so there's a danger on the road. And what's that danger? Well, that there's, there's actual predators on this road. And, and the predators aren't just hiding behind rocks and coming out of the darkness. They actually put clothing on to look like the sheep that they present themselves as the innocent members of the fold, as participants in the kingdom, but they are actually the predators in disguise. And how do we know the difference? Well, I love this. Like The Old Testament had very specific ways. If they speak something and it doesn't come true, if they make a prediction and it doesn't happen, all right, that seems, that's, that's pretty good. If they lead people away from the one true God, if they're directly deni- in denial of the law itself or advocate for idolatry, do you see why Jesus needed to cover his ground here? He's like, I'm not one of those people. I'm not one of those false prophets. And so what I wanted to point out, I'm like, okay, I get that. Those three things make sense, but it's almost like I know a wolf when the wolf bites me or eats me. Those are all very obvious things. If, if the thing's biting me, it's a wolf. I get it. Those are very clear distinctions. And so there's more than that that he gives us to check out. So the wolf puts on this costume, and it can only cover over the wolf. It's a surface-level presentation. And if you interact with the wolf and you start to dig deeper, what are you going to find underneath? A freaking wolf. If you spend enough time with a wolf, eventually it gets hungry and it can't hide itself anymore. And it's like, ah, no, I'm a sheep, I'm a sheep, I'm a sheep, nope, I'm a wolf. So, so time and fruit of this person is measured by you digging and getting to know them. For, for, for at some point, the facade just comes crumbling down to reveal the truth. But the fruit comes from the very DNA of the plant that it gives. And so if you have an actual fruit-bearing tree and you dig, what do you find? More fruit-bearing tree stuff. I don't know what you call it. The longer you're with it, the deeper you dig, the more certain you become, oh, this is just a tree that bears fruit. There's no wolf to be had here. It's exactly what this thing is built for. You come over here and like, oh, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You're, you're a fruit-bearing tree. Oh, oh you, you seek after justice and righteousness? You're a fruit-bearing tree. You're a person that loves your enemies? Fruit. You're the kind of person that turns the other cheek. You're the kind of person that leans towards generosity and not greed. You are a fruit-bearing tree. And the longer you're with the tree, the more confirmed you are that this tree is exactly what it is supposed to be made of, exactly the kind of fruit that it is producing. You're a fruit-bearing tree, and so the fruit becomes the testimony that vouches for the prophet or the disciple. That's the long-range fruit. You have behaviors, but you also have some stuff that goes over a long period of someone's lifespan. What kind of disciples are they making? What kinds of things are they putting out? Is their message consistent or do they wave to and fro with every doctrine that comes from the seasons of life? What is this person made of, the stuff of Yahweh or the stuff of something else? And I wanted to make a note because they make the note in here that even powerful, mighty deeds and signs are not necessarily fruit. They might accompany someone who is fruit-bearing, but it says here that even these things can even be recreated by demonic activity or even human deceit. And so these temporary things, these wow kind of offerings, they can provide a kind of assurance because Jesus did those things. But at the same time, if all of these other things aren't present, you have reason to question whether you're dealing with a sheep or a wolf. Now, the metaphor continues and concludes with this idea that if there are thorns and thistles, 
which don't bear fruit and are troublesome to the harvesters as they harvest, that those things are considered bad trees. And what's the only thing that a bad tree is used for? You burn it in the fire. So it goes through the gate that leads to Gehenna into the dump and they burn it. All right. Again, a striking metaphor. We don't have time to get into all the nuances and interpretations of what hell is, but it's not good. It's not good. Now, now the false guides that are here are trying to lure you towards this other path. They're pushing you in this way. It says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in your name perform miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. Now there's false disciples that accompany the false prophets. They can confess with their mouth verbally. And it doesn't necessarily indicate a repentant heart. They can mimic powers and acts in Jesus' name, but the activities are meaningless. They are able to deceive even themselves and others into believing something, but they don't actually know God. This is an old, tired metaphor, but it stuck with me for so long that I hope it plays well for you because someone handed me a Michael Jordan, who was everything in that time when I was a kid, handed me the card. It said, you can memorize these facts. You can tell, how tall is Michael Jordan? Six, six. How much did he weigh at the peak of his performance in the Chicago? Anyone? We got anyone that geeky? How many times did he win us? Uh, I almost said Super Bowl. <laughs> How many times did he win the championship? Six. If you showed up to Michael Jordan's house for Thanksgiving, what's going to happen? They're going to call the cops. The guards are kind of, I don't know what, he's, what kind of security he has. The point is this. You can know as much as you want. You can know and, and memorize facts but you're not actually a friend of Michael Jordan's. I know that that's been told over and over, but I'm telling you, it recurs in my mind all the time, and I think about this verse, and I think, do I just memorize facts? Do I just internalize certain things so that I can talk about this and be a part of the God conversation at church, or do I know that I know that I know this man? Do I know God? And that's been a haunting thing throughout most of my life. I have a lot of confidence that I do. But my question for you, the revelation here is that there is a thing that you are supposed to do, which is know God. It's so simple. Know God, not about him. And the very last thing that they give us in this teaching is one more metaphor. We sing about it all morning. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. Anyone been through some storms in their life recently? But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Those grounded in Jesus' teachings withstand adversity because their foundation is secure. And then it says, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed at his teaching because he taught as one who had authority and not as their teachers of the law. Okay, as we bring this to a close, I want you to stop and just put yourself in the moment. You see Jesus on a hill and you're amongst a crowd. And after this is done, this incredible moment of teaching has taken place. From this mountain, Jesus ends by drawing everything to this dividing line between himself and any other foundation of life. And there were plenty, right? We have all these Greek and Roman philosophies flying around at this time. He's like, there's no middle ground. You will either build that house over there on the sand or you're going to build it over here on the rock. So there is a difference between agreeing with these things and putting them into practice. There's a difference between saying, I like that idea of turning the other cheek, but then someone slaps you and you have to put it into practice. There's a difference between realizing all of the ways why you feel legitimately I can hate this person, and God's like, you have to love your enemies. So agreeing is different than building, and I want to use this one last thing I was praying about it this morning. I feel like what God was saying, like, 
Make sure they know, you being they in this context, God's not threatening you any more than the sun is threatening the earth when he says, stay in orbit. If you don't wander around in empty space and chaos and the cold, stay in orbit. And if you do that, you benefit from my sun, my heat. You benefit from the solar power that comes from me. You become a planet teeming with life. And I'm not threatening. I'm just saying, if you decide to leave that orbit and just go off into the chaos of space, there's, there's consequences out there. Please don't do that. Stay, organize yourself, make me the center, not a side hustle, not another thing that you add to your busy life that you're doing. Put me at the center. I am the sun, orbit around me, and I'm telling you, this is how things go well. This is how someone builds their life on me. Anything else is you just going out into nothing. Don't do that. It's not a threat, it's an appeal from someone who loves you and is like, please don't choose that choice. Don't go down that path. Stay here in this place. Choose to build your life upon me. And as a result, Jesus' teachings that we've been going over in the last, I don't know, two months or so, a little more maybe, uh, my guess is that some of you here, you may just be beginning to build something on Jesus. It takes time to build. We get that. But you also have likely built a few things over on sand, and you're like, no, no, I mean, for the most part, I'm going to be over here in this church world, but every once in a while, like, it seems like this idea is better than Jesus over there, so I'm going to do that over here. Oh, no, 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 it's Sunday morning. We're good. I'll hail the power of Jesus' name. All right, now over here, I'm going to turn into some kind of cutthroat moment of decision. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to control I'm going to make sure that I am the one who, uh, who, who holds the resources. I'm going to, I'm going to, you fill in all the blanks. And over here, he's saying, look, you've got to choose. And so there's going to be a point where you're like, okay, I'm going to start taking apart things over here. There's a demolition that needs to take place. And if I don't do it, the storm is going to demolish your building on sand anyways. It's a good bet. I'm telling you. I promise you. And he begins building over here, putting things on top. He's saying, look, we're going to live and learn and observe all of these things that we've had throughout our life that we've been learning over there. I'm going to bring them over here and say, I, I thought this to be true my whole life, but I'm surrendering it to you, God. I thought this was the definition of good, but I'm surrendering that to you, God. I thought this was the thing I was supposed to be about in my life, but I'm telling you God, this is yours now. And so I want you to stop and just take a quick moment. I'm going to lead us through a final prayer. And I want you to ask God, what are the things that you need to build? What are the things that you need to demolish over on the sand? And maybe there's some things that need to be repurposed and rebuilt over here inside of your life based on the teachings of Jesus. You've got a lot of building already done. You're never not building, right? You're never not building. So as long as you've been living and learning, you've been building on one of these two things. So what needs to be built, rebuilt, and demolished? Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this um, word. Thank you for your manifesto. Thank you for the way that it reorients and rearranges and that I begin to orbit and become uh, more about what you do in my life than anything else, Lord. But there are points when it's like, come on, let's stop Stop flirting with other things and just like make a choice. I'm, I'm all in. I'm in now. And so, Father, for those in this room, would you give them conviction to make that choice, courage to go through with it? Would you have us, Lord, be able to identify the things we've built on sand so that we can begin pulling those things apart before the storm crushes it? We want to choose you. We want to orbit around you. We want you to create a, 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 a system that is not chaos, but is in alignment with the way of your life. Father, we love you. Have mercy on us as we're learning. But have courage. Uh, give, give those courage. Let us take heart for those who are maybe in the midst of a decision-making moment. And we ask for these things right now in the name of Jesus Christ. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Pastor Jody is going to lead us um, through our response time. Take some moments uh, to reflect on the things that we've considered today.
Good morning. Well, as Pastor Eric said, we're going to take some time to respond to what we heard today, um, respond to the closure of this series. Um, we can pray. One of our pastors would be happy to pray with you after our service today. You can give. We have a box back in the back of the room where you can give. You can give online. I think Mr. Bill even talked about giving to one of our partners. Lastly, today we are going to take communion together as a body. We are entering a week where we typically give thanks. You may be gathering with friends and family this week from near and far to celebrate Thanksgiving. But there's one thing that happens towards the end of the week that's maybe occupying some of your minds already. Presents, am I right? Black Friday is coming up. And we are maybe on the pursuit of a perfect gift and the search for the best bargain. Most folks like presents. Have you stopped to think if God likes presents? My guess is yes, but I have a feeling that God really likes to give. I see God enforcing the old saying that it is better to give than to receive. God has filled our world with gifts. Can you shout some of them out? Family. Peace. Thanksgiving, did someone say that? <laughs> I think of creation, the animals, the trees. It's funny that Pastor Eric mentioned the sun, because the sun, especially this time of year, is one of my favorite things to see. These are all really great gifts, and God gave each of us a gift. Some of us may be gifted in singing, drawing, playing sports, helping, organizing, there's just too many things to mention that God has blessed us with. So as we head into the holiday hustle and bustle, let's remember that God loves us so much. He gave us the greatest gift of all, Jesus. You may have heard the saying, like father, like son. Well, the same can apply to God and Jesus. Jesus loves to give people gifts too. He gave us the gift of the Lord's Supper. And there's even more to this gift, the gift of grace. Being, by, being forgiven by Jesus is the amazing gift that we didn't deserve. Also, through this supper, he gives himself to us by the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 10 say this, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace, expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast, but we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. As we take the bread and the cup during communion today, Let's remember Jesus' incredible gift of grace. Today, let's also show him our thank you gifts of praise, song, and prayers. Gifts, grace, and gratitude. Let's say those to, together to remember what communion is about. Gifts, grace, and gratitude. So as we take communion today, I encourage you to take a brief time of meditation and then come up front here for the elements, the juice, which represents his blood, and the bread, which represents his body. The table is open to all of those who follow Jesus.
Coming to our time of close of our service where we always commission everyone out. I'm going to ask those who are here in attendance, please stand up with us. <clears throat> and would you go now um, as you leave these walls and as you leave this moment on Sunday, because you are the church, taking the church everywhere that you go, choosing to go through the narrow gate and helping others to find that path. There's something to the person that looks back and says, the gate's over here. The gate's over here. Come, come this way. So would you be gate openers, not just those who choose, but open the gate behind you and shout out to those who are walking by that there is a place um, uh, of goodness, that there is a place that is blessed, that the good life belongs to those who walk through this. And so go now as proclaimers of the narrow path, as people who are walking in the narrow path in the ways of Christ. And would you go now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Have a great day, y'all. Fear is changing now for the spirit of the Lord is here. The evidence is all around that the spirit of the Lord is here. The atmosphere is changing.
of our hearts tonight.
church mother in a church hat clap man that sugar gave her color purple coming back clap uh when that whole week beat you up and stretch you but you hear that organ playing and remind you of your blessings and on another note she just hit another note chills down my spine got me crying make me overload you don't know about it though old school church ham seekers get the humming out of drum up in the first hand lordy 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 can you hear me now church close sweaty you don't care you just get it now testify how we made martyrs out of these fathers and rose up all of his daughters to glorify him with honor 